Well, good afternoon and thank you for being here with us today as we finish up our three weeks of Common Read events. Today is the 27th and final event of the Common Read. We're very excited to have you all here today to share this very special day with us. So we have two wonderful things going on today that you will experience. The first is that we have a, a poet with us, Mr. Richard St. John, and we also will be celebrating the winners of our poetry contest. So without further ado, let me introduce Mr. Richard St. John. He's received degrees in English from Princeton University, where he graduated summa cum laude, and the University of Virginia. In 2002, he completed a mid-career Loeb Fellowship at Harvard University. His first book of poems, The Pure Inconstancy of Grace, was published in 2005 by Truman State University Press. As, and it was the first runner-up for the T.S. Eliot Prize for Poetry. His long poem, Shrine, appeared as a chapbook in 2011. His newest collection, Each Perfected Name, was released in January 2015, also from Truman State University Press. He lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he has worked in the field of neighborhood development and nonprofit management, and also created an arts-based civic engagement program called Conversations for Commonwealth. He has belatedly moved into the digital age with a website, and it's www.richardstjohnpoet.com in case you'd like to check out future readings and projects. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Richard St. John. Thank you, Susan. Well, uh, I've been asked to um, make a few connections between poetry and the good work that you've been doing exploring empathy through the common read activities you've been doing. Uh, and also to read a few of my poems, and Susan asked me to read especially for my first book. Uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, I want to start by just talking to you a little bit about my own perspective on poetry. Uh, and by poetry, I'm including fiction and all imaginative literature as well, so I'm not trying to be narrow about this. Um, there, and that's just to give you one person's aesthetic perspective. So there are a whole lot of ways of looking at poetry, and I certainly <coughs> don't want to limit them here, um, but you can look at it as play, inventiveness, cleverness, <coughs> excuse me, is the poet doing something innovative stylistically? That's one way of looking at it. You can look at poetry, you can look at poetry in terms of beauty, the sound of the language, formal composition, uh, and I really want to put in a good word for that perspective because I've had the experience that sometimes you can start to love a poem even before you really know what it might be about or what it, what it might be meaning. Uh, in fact, I had a wonderful eighth grade teacher who uh, was the person who first introduced me to poetry, and he brought in this poem to class by E.E. E. Cummings. And the poem started, Anyone lived in a pretty how town with up so floating many bells down. And there was a refrain, sun, moon, stars, rain. And I didn't have a clue what any of that was about, but I did sense that there was something important and kind of mysterious afoot. So, so the way that I find uh, most useful to look at poetry, uh, the one that resonates most for me and that I want to talk with you just a little bit about today, is to think of poetry as a kind of way of telling truth, a particular kind of truth. And I look at this as being kind of a spectrum. So on the one end, you've got math and science, and that gives you that gives you uh, one certain kind of truth, a lot of important information about the physical world. And on the other end, you've got poetry, which gives you a much, much messier kind of truth, the truth of lived human experience. And that can be uh, emotional, intellectual, cultural, all mixed up together. What does it feel like to be alive um, as a person, not as a an equation or a science experiment. So let me give you an example. Let, let's say you want to build a table. You're going to want to start with blueprints and some precise measurements, and that puts you on the science math end of the spectrum. But poetry gives you a different kind of truth. It gives you the truth of 
what's it like to experience a table. So what's it like to run your hand across the rough grain of a table? And maybe not any table, but maybe it's the beloved table that you grew up with as a child, and now you've got to sell it in order to pay for groceries. So uh, poetry is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, science and math put you in the zone of looking for answers and um, solving problems. Poetry is about experiencing, and in the course of experiencing, you're likely to run up against questions, the deep human questions of being alive. Uh, poetry, of, of course, is partly made up, um, and, but even the imaginative life grows out of the, live, the soil of the poet's lived experience. Sometimes the critics will say, poets tell lies, but when they make something up, it's in the service of um, telling a deeper truth and telling it more effectively to a reader. So there's a wonderful poem by a guy, William Matthews. Uh, before he died, he taught at SUNY New York, and it's about giving a poetry reading at West Point. Uh, and during the poetry uh, question and answer period, somebody shouts down at him, one of the cadets shouts at him and says, why are your poems so hard? Why don't you just say what you mean? And clearly, that's the person who's looking for solutions and answers. He's on the math end of the spectrum. Um, and Matthews in the poem says to him, I try to write as well as I can what it feels like to be human. And later on, he says, I don't want my poems to be hard unless the truth is, if there is a truth. And I think he means, says, if there is a truth, because when you're dealing with complex human experience, there's not one truth, there's a whole lot of different truths that people are experiencing. So if poetry doesn't give us facts and answers, what good is it for? Is it something that's just soft and optional, kind of a luxury? Well, I'm thinking that you might have experienced something a little bit like that when you've been exploring empathy. Um, nobody's really against empathy, but people will say, well, it's just so soft. I mean, really, aren't people just all in it for themselves? You know, or they might say, oh, empathy or poetry, um, that's really inefficient. Let's not get all touchy-feely about this. It's going to slow us down. It's not going to contribute immediately to the bottom line. Well, I hate it when people say stuff like that, when they say poetry's soft or poetry's ineffective, because I think of it as vital equipment for living, and that's a phrase from the literary critic Kenneth, Kenneth Burke. And when I say equipment for living, I don't mean something like a home appliance or a blender. I mean something that we carry with us and that helps us move through the world and become more excellently human. So I'm going to share with you three ways that I think of poetry as being uh, about, you know, being useful equipment for living. And this is where I think we're going to really see the connections between poetry and empathy, how poetry really can help us cultivate empathy and help call it forth from us. So the first way is that poetry distills and captures complex human experience. Um, Robert Frost, the poet, once said, poetry is a way of helping us remember things that it would impoverish us to forget. So poetry kind of captures experience in a poem so that we can share it, we can re-experience it, um, not as a slogan or a bumper sticker, but in all of its depth and nuance um, as real felt whole. Uh, so I want to share an example, a little poem by a wonderful African-American poet, Ross Gay. He teaches at the University of Indiana at Bloomington. Um, and this is a poem in which he's with his mother who is suffering from Alzheimer's. And it's a very short poem, so it comes at you quickly, so you need to be kind of alert here. Alzheimer's. She stood in her doorway, asking my name again. Something she would never remember. A breeze loosed some cherry blossoms, petals flipping through her open arms. As she whispered, look what God has done. Look what God has done. So think of the complexity that's in just those eight lines. There's this little poignant scene of a son with his mother. 
Um, there's the sense of how both beauty and tragedy come into our lives all mixed up together. Then the poem moves beyond that and kind of raises the question of, well, what's God's responsibility or non-responsibility for both the good things and bad things that come to us in life? And then I think in the poem there's also a little bit of uh, Ross Gay's kind of respect for his mother's deep religious faith, but also a note of his own ambivalence about it. So here's a second way I think that uh, poetry is equipment for living. Um, because it holds complex human experience, um, it's kind of an opportunity to study what I'm going to call comparative humanity. And that can kind of work both ways. Uh, you read a poem and it can give you a sense of the deep commonalities that we all share as people. You know, you can sense that, okay, my story is important, it's valuable, it's unique, but it's also part of a larger story, uh, the story that's shared by the poet and the poem. Uh, or um, you can experience a poem and it can sh uh, show some experience you haven't had and highlight what I'll call illuminating differences. Um, so I want to read a little section from a poem by the Greek poet Homer, who's credited with, credited with writing the two big epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, they're um, about the long war between the Greeks and the Trojans. And Troy was once also called Ilium, so um, that's how you get the title, the Iliad. Um, anyhow, this is a Greek poem. It's told from the Greek perspective. The Greeks win, they burn down Troy, and the story follows the Greek fighters as they travel back home after the war. But, in this, but it's poetry and it's not propaganda. So in this astonishing leap of empathy, Homer makes the most admirable, the most attractive character in the whole poem, at least to my mind, the, not a Greek, but the best Trojan fighter, Hector. Um, and the Iliad ends not with the big Greek victory, but with this deep note of respect for Hector's funeral rites when he gets buried after he's killed. Okay, well there's a long distance between us and the Greeks, um, between their rural, communal, pre-industrial, pre-scientific, pre-printing press, yes, even pre-internet uh, world and ours. Uh, so we have to exert great care when we try and um, read across culture and that length of time. It's a little like when you're trying to empathize with somebody um, you need to listen to them and try and understand where they're coming from and not just jump to some false assumption that they look at the world the same way you do. But I'm going to read a passage that I think does, uh, from a translation by Richmond Lat Latimer um, that I think does show not only the empathy that Homer has for his enemies, the, the uh, Trojans, uh, but also the deep commonalities that we share as human beings. So here's the scene. Um, Hector... Uh, knows in his heart that the Greeks are going to win, that he's going to die, that his wife is probably going to get carried off into captivity. But he still has to go out on the battlefield and preserve his honor and also fight to try and delay all those bad things from happening. So after talking with his wife, oh, he's standing there in his, all his battle gear and he's got a bronze helmet on and this uh, horsehair plume over the, over the helmet. And after he talks to his wife for a while, he turns and picks up his young son. So I'll read this little bit from Homer. So speaking, glorious Hector held out his arms to his baby, who shrank back to his fair girdled nurse's bosom, screaming and frightened at the aspect of his own father. Terrified as he saw the bronze and the crest with its horsehair nodding dreadfully as he thought, from the peak of the helmet. Then his beloved father laughed out and his honored mother. And at once, glorious Hector lifted from his head the helmet and laid it in all its shining on the ground. Then, taking up his dear son, he tossed him about in his arms and kissed him and lifted his voice in prayer to Zeus and the other immortals. Zeus and you other immortals, grant that this boy, who is my son, may be as I am, preeminent among the Trojans, great in strength as am I, and rule strongly over Ilium. And someday let them say of him, he is better by far than his father. 
Well, any father might say something like that about his son or feel something like that about his son. Uh, and so I think the poem captures these deep commonalities across just culture and time, not as an abstraction, but as a real experience that we can share and experience ourselves. Um, as, but as a study of comparative humanity, um, kind of a window onto other people's experience, poems can also, sometimes at the same time, um, also highlight illuminating difference. So I'm gonna read a poem by uh, probably my favorite living poet, uh, Guy Frank X. Gaspar, and most of his poems are about his very wide-ranging religious reading. But this poem is about surfing. Uh, Gaspar grew up in a working-class Portuguese fishing family in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Now he teaches and lives in um, Long Beach, California. And the opening of this poem gives a little bit of a feel for what it's like where he lives, because he sort of describes driving in his Jeep to the beach. And I think the opening of the poem also gives a little bit of a feel for the kind of settling in you do mentally before you have to face the really demanding mental focus of surfing. So this poem is called, and again, it's Frank X. Gaspar, it's called Hurricane Douglas, Hurricane Elida. Here they come again, those Pacific hurricanes. And here I go in the old white Jeep, sandy and musty with boards and wetsuits and damp towels, down the boulevard, down the bougainvillea and the jacaranda, the red lights and the green lights, the Shell Station and the Union 66 Station, the 7-Eleven, Anita's Escrows, Pacific Coast, Met Post Pacific Coast Medical Group, Tiny Nailers Restaurant, the Los Altos YMCA, houses and houses behind their honeysuckled walls and rows of palm trees curving up to the muggy sky. A left turn on the highway and watch um, the rivers in their concrete bunkers glassy now because the wind has not shifted onshore yet. Good. And then turn down toward the pier and wedge into a parking space and then down the sand and there they are again, rolling in like boxcars, swell after swell, angling off the bar under the pier, half again over my head. And then, for the first time ever, the thought that I am too old, too weak, too short of breath. This is fear. How comely and appealing it is. How it slows me, pulling on my wetsuit and fins, waxing the board. How it makes my pragmatic heart so ready, knocking against my ribs in a way that I can hear it all the way up in my head. But bang, bang, go the breakers. And in I go again, and dig in with my arms, and get stuck inside a big set, pulling and pulling, and getting nowhere, duck diving under the white water, heaving a breath into myself when I come up, digging again to take back the distance I've already lost, digging and breathing like there's no turning back, because, after all, there isn't now. And this is where I prefer to leave it, this plain, small poem digging and breathing like it wants to avoid some classic fate or some failure of will or some defect of character, bragging into all the noise and commotion, all the rips and undertow, that there will be a last time, but this is not it. Well, perhaps some of you have been surfing. I gather that you can surf at Rockaway Beach or maybe some other places in Queens. I haven't, so for me, this poem gives uh, a little window onto some illuminating difference, a sense of what it's like to surf in a way that's far deeper than the sort of airbrushed movie images you get of somebody who's just riding gloriously along the crest of a wave. But even if you have been surfing, Gaspar invites us into another illuminating difference because he doesn't give us a young person surfing, which is what you usually think about, but he shows us an older person taking these risks, and he invites you into his head, his heart, and into his fear, too. So this is also a poem about fear and courage, 
you know, how do we accept our own mortality and our own limitations, but also how do we carry on with courage as a person, as a poet, or as we face any kind of difficulties in life. Uh, and that maybe gets us back to Hector and the battlefield and courage there and those deep commonalities again. So whether it's deep commonalities or illuminating difference, poetry helps us enter into somebody else's experience and that's what empathy is all about. So before I read uh, some of my own poems, I want to um, mention a third way that, uh, empath that the poetry works as uh, equipment for living. Uh, and this surely relates to empathy. And it's that po poetry calls forth things from us and it evokes things from us, feelings and actions. When the Greek philosopher Plato tried to imagine his ideal republic, he didn't want any poets in it. But he didn't kick the poets out because they were too soft and ineffective. He kicked them out because he thought they would be too effective. He thought that they would get people all worked up emotionally and start acting in ways that didn't fit into his neat, rational universe. Well, I would keep the poets in the Republic uh, because I don't believe we're such dupes of what we read that we, when we encounter human experience in a poem, we can decide what stance do we want to take to it. Do we want to embrace it and carry it with us? Do we want to distance ourselves from it and say, okay, that's real experience, but it's not something I want to do? Or do we just want to ask questions about it? So I'm going to read a very short poem by Naomi Shihab Nye. She is Arab American. She lives in San Antonio. And I've often used this poem at the start of community meetings or board meetings because it really does evoke and call forth a kind of spirit of empathy and generosity. So this poem's called Red Brocade. And again, this is by Naomi Shihab Nye. The Arabs used to say, when a stranger appears at your door, feed him for three days before asking who he is where he's come from, where he's headed. That way, he'll have strength enough to answer. Or by then, you'll be such good friends, you don't care. Let's go back to that. Rice, pine nuts. Here, take the red brocade pillow. My child will serve water to your horse. No, I was not busy when you came. I was not preparing to be busy. That's the armor everyone put on to pretend they had a purpose in the world. I refuse to be claimed. Your plate is waiting. We will snip fresh mint into your tea. So in that spirit, I hope of generosity on your part. I'm going to read uh, some of my poems. Um, they're not about empathy, but I'll try and make some connections with empathy along the way. Uh, this I'm going to start with a poem about truth-telling and reconciliation. It's kind of a ghost story involving my father. It's set on Halloween, so there are a number of family stories in the poem. There's a story my father told about on Halloween. He was out in this car, and a car was seen at the scene of a crime, and it looked just like their car. And then there are two stories in the poem where neither my father nor I really told quite the truth. It was kind of a gray area. Uh, one was about a, ax a mysterious ax automobile accident that might have been alcohol related, and the other is when I left a little toy saw that had a real blade on it in our backyard, and later on our dog came back with a hurt paw. So, but October 31st is not just Halloween, uh, it's also uh, all Saints Eve, and that's the date, uh, it's the date that Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther, um, nailed his 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral, started the Protestant Reformation, and he did that protesting in part about what he called false indulgences. And that was a, a thing where you would pay the church in order to receive forgiveness so that your relatives didn't have to spend as much time in purgatory. It was kind of a money-making scheme, like selling the relics of saints. To, to make money. So the poem starts with two epigraphs about that. But I think it touches, does suggest one thing about empathy, uh, and that is the need to kind of make ourselves vulnerable, 
to admit the darkness in ourselves and to kind of give up on the stories that we either project onto other people or carry along with us. So the poems All Saints Eve and here are the two epigraphs. The first one's from John Tetzel, who was one of the guys who would sell indulgences. Listen to the voices of your dear dead relatives and friends beseeching you and saying, pity us, pity us. We are in dire torment from which you can redeem us for a pittance. And the second's from Martin Luther. Indulgences are pernicious because they induce complacency. Man must first cry out that there is no health in him. He must be consumed with horror. This is the pain of purgatory. I do not know where it is located, but I do know it can be experienced in this life. All Saints Eve. This is the night the dead are out. I am searching the streets of Blahnox, past the boarded machine shops and the darkened marble works. I am looking for a gray Chevrolet, the car my father talked about to say why we must always tell the truth. He had cruised with friends one Halloween, and a gray car just like theirs was seen speeding from a robbery. Police had come while he was gone. His mother had to know for sure that he was innocent. My headlights catch some crumpled candy wrappers in the weeds. A cracked mask flares up white. I hear the starlings gathered in the truss work of the darkened bridge, and there it is, or may be, pulled beneath the underpass. The car door sticks but opens. The dash gives everything an eerie underlight. I can't quite make him out, slouched there opposite. We sit in silence, and I smell. In memory or now? His smell, his smoky clothes, a tinge of alcohol. I think of how one time he came home late, his nose bandaged, a nasty gash above one eye. He said that he'd been looking at the moon. My mother didn't say a thing. I went out in my pajamas and stared at the crumpled fender. The pale, illuminated skin on everything, my hand, the frayed upholstery, is like the moon as seen from childhood, the moon across night snow. Imagined, buried by neglect beneath that snow, my saw blade with a plastic handle. But real that afternoon, a little line of blood, our hobbling dog that yelped and bit its paw. Cut by an icicle, it assumed. Oh, my father bandaged it. Cut by an icicle, it assumed. And maybe he was right. Still, I found the saw in the snowmelt, lying on long grass, speckled with look, what looked like rust. What has he come to say? this night of bones and false indulgences. We sit, a dark congruence, illuminated only by the glow of the stilled speedometer, the mute O of the other gauges, distance, fuel. Oh, what is there to hide from one another? What is there to fear? We have said nothing, but we have shared at least a truth we know, this gray relic by the bridge abutment. The latch catches as I slide out, and taking the benediction of the dashboard lights, we leave by our separate doors. This next poem is written for a good friend of mine uh, in community development whose son was killed in a drive-by shooting while he was accidentally, I mean, when he was quite innocently coming home uh, from his job at the hospital. Uh, the poem's called The Darkened Mosaic, and it starts with an epigraph from the poet W.B. Yeats. And Yeats wrote a famous poem uh, in which he's looking at these saints in a gold mosaic from Byzantium. And in his poem, he says to them, O sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall. Um, this poem, my poem, touches on empathy in a couple ways. One, of course, my feeling for my uh, friend, uh, 
uh, which, and her son, which was a good deal more motivating than any kind of abstract love of humanity. Um, but it's also a poem about kind of doing the right thing, like acting from compassion and empathy, uh, even when it doesn't seem like it's gonna make any difference. We may not know the truth of how do we fix our broken world, uh, but perhaps we can embody that truth in our actions. So this poem's called The Darkened Mosaic for Rhonda Brandon and her son, LaRue. Here's the epigraph. I am happy, and I, I think full of an energy, of an energy I had despaired of. It seems to me that I have found what I wanted. When I try to put all in a phrase, I say, man can embody truth, but he cannot know it. W.B. Yeats in a letter two weeks before his death. The night I learned your son was shot, I went past the boarded monastery, up steep Pius Street, past the crooked graying teeth of houses on their Appalachian lots, past the parents joking on the wooden stoops, to the little asphalt playground at the top, with the city stretching out beneath. A woman swept her walk. Kids scuffled hockey sticks and chased the fading puck across the pavement, less by sight than sound. A girl spun her younger brother on the twirl around. And on the swings, two boys arched their backs and stretched, reaching their shoe tips up toward the twisted X's of the fence top mesh. On the hillside steps, some older kids hung out. The noise of radios marked out a space for them to talk and watch the city lights come on. How could they play or swing or sit? How could that woman keep on sweeping in the face of it? Not just your son, but the whole city, it seems, undone. Kids smash the street lights, trash collections down to every other week. Still, she sweeps, although it does no good. She's only moving grit from place to place, knocking a pebble loose and scuffing the rusted reinforcement rods exposed beneath like bones in an x-ray scan, or watching her sweep like cords across the back of her extended hand. Maybe your son was just the small gray knuckle of a stone somewhere in the crumbling urban aggregate. After all, what had he really done at 22? A medical supply technician, steady at the hospital, affectionate to his fiance and you, and yet, that woman bent to her broom in the coming dark, in accord with mysteries beyond effect, a structure or a rightness running through. Her sweeping and the swinging up and out and the children spinning like the constellations on the twirl about all make a motion. And the motion with the structure brings unseen a burnishing. And with this burnishing, the stones appear, become a sprawled mosaic. Every burnished stone alight among the city lights spread out below. The pale peach vapor lamps in rows along the highways. The moving glimmer of a bus. The bluer street lights coming on. And lights of houses. Every light a room. Each room an individual. I try to picture it, a wall of inlaid fire, the whole perfected city, but something else appears, more like a human face, like his or yours. Just gonna read three, three more poems here. Uh, this next poem is a poem that sounds like a religious story. It's taken, the first part's taken from the legend of St. Julian, the second part's kind of made up. But the poem really explores kind of the mystery of giving and receiving, how intertwined they are, and how we can't often tell the difference between one or the other. And in terms of empathy, I think that reminds us that we can do a lot of damage if we try too hard to be saints and try and rescue people and save people. Uh, that when we're moved to action, we need to recognize that we're also receiving something, that we're in a relationship and the other person has gifts to give to us too and that our hearts are being enlarged. So this poem is called The Sainthood of St. Julian. In the traditional version, 
Young Julian is given everything. Richly tooled books, saddles, horses, hounds, falcon, title to the estate. The boy turns vicious, caught himself by the lust of the hunt, treasuring the majestic stance of an eight-point buck crumpled to its knees. The paralyzed look of peasants scattering like chaff in a field before his coming hooves. By accident, he kills his parents. And afterwards, he gives up all, walks barefoot 50 years. We see him in the end, health broken, leaning on his wizened staff. It's December, almost dark. He's waiting on the riverbank for the ferry. This is not death, just a real riverbank and a real wooden boat, far out of sight, out of hearing. He waits. The wind cuts through his thin cloak. From nowhere, in the ebbing light, a figure appears, a leper with open sores on his face and forearms. In a whisper, curled with sour breath, he asks to share the cloak. Then for the warmth of Julian's embrace. And last, for a kiss, full on those corroded lips. It is the Christ that Julian kisses, and the two ascend. In another account, every detail is the same, except that Julian, waiting by the river, Let's fall his staff, tries to warm his hands against his rigid body. He recalls his dead parents, his childhood friends, lost through viciousness, through time. Even God has left him. He almost believes he would give it all up, his prayer, his penitence, for a warm fire, some good wine. From nowhere, the leper comes with nothing, even a shawl to share. And sitting by the barefoot, hunched old man, gives Julian that welcome, scrofulous kiss. So empathy can take the form, of course, of care for an individual, uh, but it can also be more systemic. As Martin Luther King put it, justice is love. Uh, when it's correcting that which revolts against love. So it can be an act of empathy to uh, live into the larger callings that we face in life. I'm gonna read a poem called Lanima Simplicetta, written for a young girl, Ebony, Patter Ebony Patterson, from a low-income neighborhood in Pittsburgh. Uh, and she was killed accidentally by a schoolmate, but unlike the situation in the ar darkened mosaic, I didn't know her personally. Um, I don't wanna give you the feeling that Pittsburgh is a scary place, um, it's a very safe city, uh, but I was working in community development, so I was feeling these things keenly. So you don't need to know this, but it deepens your experience of this poem if you have a little bit of background from Dante's Divine Comedy. So everybody knows that Dante, pretty much, everybody knows that Dante and his guide Virgil go down the nine circles of hell, um, but they also travel together up the seven steps or terraces of Purgatory Mountain. And there was one step or terrace for each of the seven deadly sins. So on the smoky terrace of wrath, they get into a little discussion with another character about lanima simplicetta, the simple soul. And the fourth step or terrace, where in this poem the poet is told to sit, was the terrace of love defective, insufficient love. The poem also alludes to the calling of the prophet Isaiah. He was a reluctant prophet. He said, I'm a person of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. So in the story, an angel takes a burning coal from the altar and touches it to his lips to purify them before sending them out to speak to his fellow citizens. Lanima Simplicetta. Dear Mr. St. John, thank you for thinking of me. I am fine though I have no words to say how it is here. You ask what you should do. Set down your poem about the man who's blinded by the smoke while climbing up the Mount of Purgatory and about the simple soul. Take back the bullet from my brain. 
pick up my school books and my hat from the pavement. Follow the stray shot back. When you get to Marshall, take the gun from his hand and recollect the smoke. Tell him I'll come sometime to loose the knot of anger from his neck. But you must keep on walking to my school. Climb up its seven stone steps, and on the fourth step sit, and weigh the flattened bullet in your hand. It is such a light, slight thing, and it is not. It is all the weight of our whole world. It is what we make. Now do something that will not make sense. Touch it to your lips, this cold, dark coal, then set it just beneath your tongue. Of course it leaves a bitter taste. Let it dissolve. Let it become your bones. Let it cloud your brain. Let it impair your speech. And let your tongue, at all the worst of times, suddenly speak the obvious. Let it never stop speaking the obvious. Yours, Ebony. So I'm going to end with a poem from my newer, newest book. And it's about kind of what I call moments of multiplication. When sort of through human compassion or empathy, you get a situation where everybody gets something more and better together than they would on their own. Um, so maybe let's imagine you're standing at a bus stop and you get into a conversation about something even as simple as the weather. And maybe you take the risk of taking the conversation a little bit further. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, this poem is um, set on the winter solstice, the darkest day of the year, uh, riding a greyhound on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, uh, reading a newspaper, and then turning to read a play by George Bernard Shaw uh, about St. Joan, who, of course, was the young French girl and religious visionary who uh, became a general and helped the French defeat the British at Orleans. Uh, as we read the newspaper, I think, um, it often seems like all of our actions come back to haunt us. And there's a kind of fairness to that, a moral symmetry, and that's where the poem starts. But there's also a moment of kind of grace and transformation and it ends in a different place. So it's called Reading Shaw's Play, St. Joan, At the Solstice, On a Greyhound, Heading Home. The year comes round again with its own dark fairness. Out on the turnpike, flecks of sleet, lightning through night clouds, ghostly then stark, echo of thunder. In the tabloid at my seat, old scatterings return, flicker of war in the Congo and Sudan, late season hurricanes, tainted meat. All around me, whispered conversations of the poor, Two rows up, a solitary reading lamp. We're making good time, but where? The bus outruns its headlights in the dark, sucking diesel fuel. I turn back to Joan of Arc, where the French cause seems lost, too. No one believes in her, but Joan insists. God speaks to me. I hear his voice. That's your imagination, they reply. Of course, she says. Isn't that how God speaks? It's snow now. Giddy, dizzy flakes are multiplying everywhere. They clean the air, like once when I was lost in abstract speculation, and a good friend asked, can't we cut the crap and just agree we're all together on this bus? At the service stop, we pile out, all of us, laughing. Woman in a burqa holds her daughter up, who points at the wildering white, amazed. Jesus, it's beautiful, a guy with a Rasta cap and dreadlocks says as he catches a snowflake on his outstretched hand. The year in its fairness comes round again. Thank you so much for your patience, and especially the people who are standing up. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Mr. St. John. We do appreciate you reading your poetry to us and sharing the words of others, showing us that we can express sympathy in many ways. Jean Darcy's students in English 101, they did a photo shoot. I want you to just put, look this way for a moment. When we think about Until I Say Goodbye, the author goes back to her memories. She finds that it's so important to take the pictures that she has in a closet, in a box, to organize them, to look at them once again. She chooses to live her final year of life with joy by taking trips with her children, but she also wants to remember these very special times. So Professor Darcy's students decided that they would share cherished photos of meaningful moments that they never want to forget. Some are of family, some are of friends. I don't know what that's of. <laughs> Maybe that's just a funny moment that someone wants to remember, right? But we can all imagine why some of these things would be important to those people. Think back yourselves about things in your lifetime that were important to you. Bring those things up from your memory and share them with someone. In your memory, they're just there and quiet. Bring them back to life. So share your memories. I'd like to take a moment to thank the judges from our poetry contest. And we have two of them with us. So one of them is Professor Peter Gray, another is Professor Ben Miller, and another is Professor Jody Childers, who were really excited to read all the beautiful poetry that was submitted. And they had a really hard job picking the winner. So we have six finalists. We have at least three of them with us today. There was supposed to be more, but we have at least three of them with us today. So before we get to our finalists, I would like to Professor Childers to come and share some exciting news. So I was so um, delighted with the, the poetry that I read um, for the contest. And what was interesting to me about it is that it also fits the theme of our uh, literary journal that we're creating right now. This is DeWinde. This is the journal of the Queensboro Creative Writing Club. And it's a really beautiful, high quality journal. And this is all student work. So what we're going to do with the contest winners is we're going to give you all the opportunity, the all six finalists, to have your work also published in Duende. So be sure to see me after. And you also, as part of your, you know, everything that you get today, you'll get a free copy of the journal so you can take a look at it. So thank you. How exciting. So they're actually going to be published authors. That's fabulous. Okay, so again, uh, in alphabetical order, because we want to be as fair as possible, I would like to call up Daniel Agapitos to read his poem, <laughs> Snow Trek. Snow Trek. As cozy as one can be, safe from the elements, but bored with reality, I stare out my window and see chores that wait for me. A neighbor hunched over in pain has seen better days. Though he shovels, never does he complain. I do not wonder why, since life goes on, whether he needs a cane or even support for his enduring brain. Anyone should relate to this, as we grow older and mature, a trek through the snow means so much more. Thank you so much. Okay. 
Another finalist is Julian Cepeda. Thank you. It's Julian. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Wilt. I held her hand. Her palms were sweating. Tears slid down her cheeks continuously. I focused on the simplicity of the white walls. I dared not to sink eyes with her. She was broken with no repair. Life would go on, but flowers would no longer flourish the same. The loss of an infant was an earth-shattering experience. I knew the pain all too well. The doctor spoke softly. She nodded distractedly. Her eyes disconnected from all that was living. I knew no words could comfort this wound, so I just held her hand. <laughs> Thank you. Our next finalist is, and I'm not sure if she's here yet, Ram, Rama Hussein. She had class and she was gonna try and get here, okay. Is Ashika Lawrence Reed here? Okay. Ah, thank you. Okay. Flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood. We, the children of this earth, come into being by birth, are at a slow divide at the mercy of our pride. We all depend on each other to survive, yet we walk around with our Jekyll and Hyde, turning up noses at the poor and smiling at only those we adore, rolling eyes at those who don't fit the mold, blocking ears to those crying hungry and cold, sealing lips to speak out for what's right, yet readily curl up fists for a fight. Step away from the mirror where you only see you. Then possibly this message can get through. Take a look around and finally see everyone else that is trapped and needing to be free. Someone in pain, broken down and alone, a person who is struggling on their own. And finally, after this knowledge is in part, maybe consider someone else's heart. Thank you. And our oh, last finalist, Justine Biscaglia. You feel everything and you're terrified. Their eyes tell more stories than any lips ever could. Your heart cries when they do and you're terrified. You burst into flames when they're angry and you're terrified. And when their hands shake, your heart shakes with them. But when they smile, God, when they smile, time stops and there are fireworks, electricity through your veins, a jolt against your caged heart, a softness in your chest, and you're not terrified. You feel everything. Okay, is the moment we've been waiting for. Okay. Our three honorable mentions who will each receive a $25 gift card. I'm gonna say it wrong and she's gonna get mad at me. Julim? Julim Cepeda. Come on up. Congratulations. Thank you. The next honorable mention is Ashika Lawrence Reed, who received a $25 gift card. She's not here, we'll make sure she gets that. The next honorable mention is Love Me Blanchard, who's unable to attend, but we'll make sure she gets that. And now we're in the home stretch, folks. Okay, so third place, 
Receiving a $50 gift card is Daniel Agapitos. Congratulations. In second place is Rama Hussein. And in first place is Justine Viscaglia. And she'll receive a $100 gift card. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's hear it for our winners. And for everyone who submitted to the poetry contest, thank you so much. Again, you did wonderful work. This has been an incredible experience, focusing on empathy this semester. I want to thank all the students and faculty and staff who made donations. We've had collections of eyeglasses, food and women's toiletries. We will be collecting until the end of the month. She's back. She left. Come over here. <laughs> Get over here. Ashika, right? Ashika, you stepped down for a minute. We missed you. That's okay, but congratulations. You got honorable mention and a $25 gift card. Thank you. I wondered where she went to. So we'll be doing our collections until the very end of the month. Gentlemen, gentlemen, thank you. Don't forget to pay it forward. Those of you who have your pay it forward cards, just thinking about empathy is not enough. We're asking you to do something positive. Do something positive for someone else. When you see someone who needs a hand, lend a hand. Maybe someone needs help studying. Maybe someone doesn't have enough change in their pocket for that cup of coffee that they really need. Or maybe someone just can't get on the bus or train because their Metro card just won't work. So think about helping someone else. Try to do something positive each and every day for someone else and pay it forward. You can use your pay it forward cards. You can do it on your own. Go to our website, qcc.cuny.edu backslash common read. And at the bottom of the page, you'll see a tab to pay it forward. Click there. You'll have an opportunity to share what it was like to pay it forward and do something for someone, or if you were on the receiving end, what did it feel like? I think if we can just think about it, just do something outside of yourself. What a great world we would have, much better than it is today. There's too much going on, too much negativity. Each and every one of us can make a difference. Each and every one of you can make a difference. So I want to thank you all for coming here today. I want to congratulate our winners once again. And I want to thank our faculty who have really spent so much time and effort working together to create these wonderful events and work with you on, on what's happening in your classrooms. Um, I want to thank our committee members here for reading your beautiful words and spending so much time hemming and hawing over who should win. And we want to thank you for the opportunity for these authors to be published. So thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend.